Hello, hello. It is Zaid, and I'm back with another episode of Drama Quest for you all. Uh, just a reminder before we jump in, please check out the socials, which are in the episode description here. Uh, feel free to join the Discord. We can get together and talk about upcoming episodes, what you'd like to see. And I'm always looking for more folks to interview. Um, I'd also like to say that we should be having a really, really special guest later this week. So look forward to that. Can't wait to bring it to you. Other than that, sorry about the delay between getting this episode out and the last episode out. As you know, Mischief had a, uh, a new expansion launch, Secrets of Fade Were. I plan to do an episode on that, so I won't talk about it too much here. But you know how expansion launches go. They take a lot of time. So I led that one for my guild. And of course, we won it. So not much more to be said on, on that front during this episode. Anyway, today is going to be about the Lockjaw server. Um, I do have the Ragefire server slated. It came out um, technically a few days before Lockjaw, so I hate to do these out of order. However, our, lock, our, uh, our Rage of Fire guest isn't able to get with us till after the 4th of July, so didn't want to have a huge break between the historical content releases. Anyway, let's jump in. So when you listened to the previous episode with Melusine on Lockjaw, you heard about how that server went. And um, after losing there, I personally and Faceless generally you know, we we always wanted to run it back. We wanted another opportunity. I learned a lot. That was my first TLP. And uh, the big takeaways I took from that were like, the top guild really sets the tone for the server. And I felt like we could have a positive server community on one of these TLPs. I thought that you could have a server where people mostly got along and where everybody who was of the appropriate caliber had an opportunity an opportunity to access content, maybe not equitably, but no one would be totally shut out. So I had that vision. And there was a, a guy from um, Ascent, a former officer from Ascent named Tadadar, who uh, now goes by The King. He's he's kind of a big player in the early TLP economies on a lot of servers, but uh, he was a good friend of mine. And we always talked about like, you know, what it would take to, to win a classic rush. It was before the meta was really defined. You know what I mean? These TLPs came three to five years apart. So... It wasn't like now where you recycle it every year and everyone was totally fresh on everything. And, you know, we decided that, like, if there was ever another launch, it would be smart to just, like, roll deep on mages. Uh, and chainers definitely were not part of the meta in the same way back then. And uh, this was before mitigation of the mightier mark of the old ways. So that was kind of the thing. Now, I didn't want to let the, the Faceless Guild die, but I was also going to boot camp. So I left some friends to play... And, and keep it alive on some emulated servers for a while. And then when I got out of boot camp and I got into a place where I had like a reliable internet access, I set up a guild on test server. And the thing with test was we were going to say, hey, you know, we got locked out of content and we left because we, you know, first we were losing, two, we couldn't raid, and three, we were unhappy with the amount of cheating and macro quest on Vulac. But we can still go onto the test server and raid on our own time with our own prerogatives. So that's what we did. We would start in classic. And then when we beat all the classic raid mobs at the appropriate level with as close to the appropriate gear and, and character power as possible, we would go to the next one. As soon as we killed it, we would open the new things, right? But I was really um, a stickler for having to kill every single raid mob that was able to be killed in the era. So like in classic, we couldn't do Kazakh Thule or Inrook because they were revamped versions. But like and Velius, we were actually locked into Velius on test server for like an extra couple weeks because of Woshi. Now, Woshi is not a hard target to kill, but on test server, he's dead all the time because anytime some random high level pops into Awakening Lance, they just automatically kill him because he aggros you. Like we actually had a bat phone on the test server and we would bat phone some of the hard to get targets. Emperor Sra was another one. People, for some reason, always killed Emp Sra. So... I actually had to like, I, I would go to these mobs and I would stand there when they were up and try to wait till it was like prime time. And people would come on high levels and I'd be like, hey, you know, we're trying to kill this. We're just like a progression guild doing our thing. I'd explain kind of like how the guild worked. And most people were really cool about it. We did have some some instances where people would like intentionally grief us. Sometimes we thought it was EOE, but I, I think most of the time we didn't have a credible source. You know what I mean? It was just like, that was our natural villain to blame. I definitely remember on test during our Kunark run, we were like going for open world track and on. I, I say open world, but there was only open world. So anyway, we were going for track and on and we had 50 people because it was a big guild. Like it was very popular. Uh, we, we were in the drugs area, like moving up on poop mountain and some level like 95 character just ran right through our raid. 
grabbed track and killed him in like two seconds. And I was just kind of astounded by that, like that you would just like see 50 other people there and, and run by them and do that. But anyway, that was kind of how test was. Once we get into got to the instance content or even just like slightly later content, it got a lot better. But even during GOD doing open world stuff, we would get trained by high levels and, and griefed a little bit. So we did that and the guild went all the way up to underfoot house of Thule area. Um, I personally left in prophecy of row. That was like the furthest I had gone. I, I poked back in now and then for a raid, but I was no longer leading the guild at that point. And we did that over the course of like two and a half or three years. Every summer the guild would like reset. And just for the summer months when population kind of dimmed in EQ, we would uh, redo classic. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, there were some other people who did similar things back then. I think Frenzik and Mabu did a guild called Progression X or something along those lines on the Trakanon server. Now, um, the test server was much better for this because you could test copy a character from any server, including TLP servers, onto test and immediately jump in. Also, we could hand you a bunch of gear, like you could make a level one character on Front of Eye. We could hand you relevant gear for our current era. You would test copy, give it back, and your test character, as soon as it was leveled up, was ready to join us at raids. You didn't have a ton of gearing to do. So it made it a really low barrier for entry for people. Test was also free. Um, but yeah, on tracking on server, you had virtually none of those benefits. The server was dead. There was no economy. Uh, people were less likely to grief you in open world on raid mobs, but the recruitment, I imagine, was much harder. Anyway, they did their guild there. And uh, there was like oddly some like drama back and forth on the forums that led to later animosity. But it was mostly minor stuff. So anyway, we find out new TLPs are coming. Rage fire's coming. And this is like, hey, sound the alarm bells, hit the bat phone, tell everybody, because this is what we have been waiting for. Uh, and at this time, I'm now like years into my Navy career. And I'm, I'm working on uh, what's called a watch floor. And it's a 12-hour on, 12-hour off kind of shift work. Rage fire is launching in the middle of one of my 12-hour shifts. And like, when you're on this kind of thing, you're considered essential personnel. So you just really cannot get off of it at all. And I'm like, shit, man, like I've been waiting for years, I had the plan. I've got the guild ready. You know what I mean? We kept it together just for this kind of thing. And it's, it's, we're going to fumble the ball here, like at the starting line, just because of scheduling shit. So, uh, rage fire launches and I can't even, I can't commit to going hard. So we just kind of are very, you know, we're pussyfooting about this whole thing. We're not committed to it. We don't set up any kind of groups or statics. We just say, hey, you know, we'll make a guild or whatever when we can get on. I couldn't play the first day, but it was fine because the Rage Fire launch day was a disaster. It was actually by far the worst TLP launch ever. Not only was there like a, a ton of queues and everything. In fact, I think the Rage Fire queue initially locked everyone except for one player out. It was like some guy who was streaming on Twitch and it's what revealed that certain players had flags to get past like the server lock screen. We didn't even have queues at that time. It just said like player capacity is full. So you couldn't log in and you just had to spam it over and over and over until you got in. Then when you got in, there was some kind of bug that let you level up to 50 like instantly. And it was just madness, absolute madness. They actually had to just like take the server down, reset it put it up the next day so it was like a whole day late on its own and then get a clean launch. So that's what they did. Rage Fire is on and the demand is, is astronomical and for like a day and a half that continues and they finally say, okay, we're rolling out another server. It's going to be called Lockjaw, named after the crocodile named in the Oasis zone. So we're like, cool. When is the date? It's, the, the, you know, they put the date out. And the date actually works. It works for my schedule. So I'm like, all right, let's go in. But before this happened, when we were on Rage Fire, we, we ended up with like some really casual guild called, I think, Faceless Discord on there with some of the people from emulated servers, some of the people from Test who were still around. And notably, we had agreed to absorb this guild called Black Syndicate from Vulak, which you might remember from this, the, the episode with Mel. Now on, um, on Vulak, we were sort of friendly, but we competed with each other sometimes. And uh, it wasn't like we weren't like besties or anything. You know what I mean? There was some animosity, but it wasn't a lot. Anyway, years had passed. We were all content to let bygones be bygones and merge into like a stronger guild, which would still be named the Faceless. <laughs> so uh, we talked to their officers. 
chiefly I talked to a guy named Darth and we were, we were all about it. Now I knew with my schedule and everything that I wasn't really going to be able to play or commit to rage fire. So I was like, Hey, you know, like long term, I'm fine with you even just being the guild leader, right? So I'm just not going to be able to do it with my work schedule. He was like, okay, cool. When Lockjaw came out, we immediately knew we were going to swap. And when we posted the advertisement for it in a, in a really organized fashion and we set up static groups, we had a ton of applicants right away. Not compared to modern TLP launches or anything, but I want to say we had like 12 or, or so, maybe even 15 groups of people set up and, and joined statics. And we were like, hey, make sure your group has like three mages at a minimum. And uh, that was that was big. So now we're sitting there and we got this like guild that we know is going to be a powerhouse going in. And I'm like, ah, we, we have this power sharing agreement. I want to walk it back. And you know what I did know? I was like, well, you know what? I, my work schedule is going to be hectic for like literally years now. So we'll keep we'll keep what we have. I'll stay on through the server first. And once that's done, we'll set up a rotation and we'll be good to go, right? Everything will be good. I'll leave and I'll let uh, Darth lead the guild. What could go wrong? And oh boy, what what went wrong? So the server launches. I'm with my boys, Arandris, Meme, Citadel, and uh, a few other folks. And we do our leveling rush. Um, the meta wasn't super defined for us at this point. I think we did some guck, some lower guck. I convinced them to do like high keep and paw. Like we kept moving around because everything felt slow in the upper 30s and lower 40s. Uh, moving around was terrible, but you know we ended up going to elite goblins. Now while we were leveling, of course you're watching everyone's levels and and seeing what's going on in the server. The other guilds on the server that time that were notable, Ascended Darkness, which was like this guild that was like a super guild combining Euro and US primetime players, so they could raid around the clock. They would have they would have separate rates for planar clears and stuff, but when it was bat phone life, they were able to to come together and, and do whatever they wanted at any time. Then we had uh, Dead Halfling Society came back. This was their third TLP. We knew they'd probably be a kind of a casual force, but they're certainly good players, so that was cool to see them there. And we had Mag M I M Magus Imperialis Magicus, notable for having been one of the three guilds on Rattlesec that killed the Sleeper, and just a big guild on that entire server, you know, lifetime when when EQ was in its prime. And they were led by Dupree. And Dupree is notable because um, he was a member of EOE on Vulac. So me and Dupree knew each other. And obviously, we, you know, we had, we had a, a bad initial sentiment because of the past. So there was those. And then there was a sleeper guild that no one knew about called Modest Man. It wasn't even really a guild at first. It was really just a group of friends led by a character named Golfine. It became clear within like the first two days that Golfine was actually Dima, who had led Citizen on the Fippy server. And at that time, he was, I think he was, yeah, he was still leading Citizen on Fippy. So he was just here. Um, initially, I think his intent was just to be kind of casual, maybe recruit a little bit or do whatever. Um, but yeah, so we're leveling up and we're communicating with all these people. And there's another guy named Sarakin who was from Twisted Legion, Twisted Legacy, which was the guild that won the Ragefire race. And I think his intent was to come over and kill the dragons and uh, do it to be like, hey, TL got the first on both servers. You know what I mean? And Sarakin was what we would call like a big, a big hacker. He was a guy who like really abused MQ, like the full suite of the tools. And he did it in an era where it wasn't quite as common. Early Lockjaw, like certainly people were using MacroQuest, but they weren't running around the way he was. Like he would, he had like multiple six boxes leveling up at the same time, automated with Kiss Assist, and Fartaunt, all that, the whole thing was part of his toolkit. So we saw that he was ahead on the leveling rush. He never, you know, because, because of the automation, never sleeping. And, you know, he's not a terrible player either. So all that together he was a little bit ahead of everyone and we, and you know that like three mages can basically kill a dragon so we're like shit when he hits 50 which will probably will be before us he's just gonna go kill him and there's nothing we can do about it so i start reaching out to other people i reach out to my guild and i'm like hey well you know what level is everybody here i i hit up dupree i hit up you who is the leader of ascended darkness and i hit up dima who is golfing and modest man Now, all those people are, are pretty well below our level. But uh, basically, 
I'm like, hey, we get everyone in a voice, all the leaders. And I'm like, I don't know the the geometry exploit, but I knew there was the geometry exploit that people use for these dragons. I just didn't know how to how to do it. And nobody knew how to do it except for Dima. And he was like, hey, I can, you know, I can run that geometry exploit. We can do the we can do the what was called a mage wall for the dragons, but we have to be higher. Or the conversation was something like this, you know what I mean? It's a while ago. And I was like, I think we just go now. Like either we wait and we lose because we we were too slow to engage. Or we go now and we lose because we are too low level or maybe it works and we're just good, right? In theory, if you have enough mages, you could kill these targets at like level two, right? With the level two mage pet, as long as um, you can keep summoning pets faster than the dragon can keep mailing pets because the pets don't get AE'd. So we decided to go for Nagafin. It's like one group of Mim, one group of Ascended Darkness. Um, it was Golfin's group for Modest Man. And then it was like six or seven groups of Faceless. So I was super happy that it was a joint raid because remember we went into this wanting to have like that positive server. Um, but by, you know, there, there's no mistake that it was primarily faceless. So we go to fire giants, we do it. Dima's Dima runs us up to the five spawn. And then we, we get the Nagafin pool at first. I think we mess up the pool. It took, it took some doing to get him right where we wanted him. Finally, you know, he's right there. The pets are going in. They're not taking much damage. And at a certain point, you're like, shit, man, it's going to work. Like, this is done. So we get the server first. And people go crazy. People were, it was like, I got like 10,000 tells. And people were hitting me up on the forums. It was wild. Um, because it was the fastest Nagafin had ever been killed. It was 40 hours after the server came up, he was dead. And the average raid level was like 36. I think my group was highest or second highest in the raid at like 44. So... It, it was a shock to people. Then we go do nag or do, do lady Vox. Same thing. Now for me at this point, it is also my girlfriend at the time is her birthday. These launches always happen right around her birthday, which is inconvenient. Um, but I had agreed like, Hey, I was going to play for like the first two days, which would hit her birthday. And then we would leave. Uh, Cause we were planning on going on a vacation to Florida. Now, remember, we had already made those vacation plans. You make that shit a long time in advance. And we found out about Lockjaw like days ago. So there, there wasn't a lot of time to cross these wires. But she knew I was passionate about this. And then I had been waiting about it, waiting, waiting for it for many years. And she also didn't really know what it was like. Like, you know, you, you try to tell your significant other what it's going to be like. But if they've never seen you do all, like a hardcore video game launch like this, they can't really wrap their head around it when you say, like, I'm going to play all day. So anyway... Vox dies. I'm like, okay, cool. Got to go. Literally get in my car and drive from Maryland to Florida. Haven't slept in like who knows how many hours. I'm like trying not to fall asleep at the wheel. Uh, it was terrible. I would try to like, I'd be driving and I'm while I'm driving, I'm like so tired. I, I could just like pass out. And then when me and the girlfriend would switch off and she would drive, I would, I would be able to check my phone and I was getting so many text messages and forum posts and everything that I was like amped up and I, I couldn't sleep because I was so excited about it. Like for me, I had been waiting three plus years for this, you know, and it, and it was finally here. So we we do all this stuff, go back and forth. I think Sarah can actually got like CT or Interruck first because he was higher level than us. And we just went up and boxed them while we while the rest of our guild was just finishing up levels and everything. But it didn't matter. The writing was on the wall. We had a, a, a ton of people, a big force. But what we did do was we we reached out to the, all the guilds that participated in that first kill, and we basically set up a, a rotation. I don't remember if Modest Man was even part of the rotation at first because they were sort of like a phantom force. It was like literally a, a guild that was just a group of people. But at the very least, Mim, led by Dupree, and AD, led by Yukan, uh, they, were, they were in it. And then uh, we further had agreed that like to get added to the rotation in the future, you would have to kill bees. That would be the thing that would let you in on the classic rotation. And the classic rotation at this time was just going to be the, the gods and the dragons. I don't think we rotated Finny. I don't think we did hate minis. And I don't think we did Sky because, you know, the spawn times were enough to accommodate pretty much everybody. So we, we go through all that. We have uh, a few other big like 20 boxers kind of spring up and start contesting us and early on it is really tough to deal with those 
back before the uh, mitigation of the mighty era because like when you have one person who's playing 20 characters it's only one person that needs to log in to kill nagafin at 3 a.m right if you're a real guild and you've got a smattering of different classes who are like mostly naked in the first week it's hard because like you need 30 people to log in to kill nagafin or you know what i mean you need you need a good chunk of people if you're not going to exploit it and if you are going to exploit it like everyone else is just kind of standing around waiting for loot so it's not good for morale to exploit it but it's hard to get the numbers at 3 a.m. to kill it. So anyway, that first week or two, boxers were a little bit of a threat. Anyway, two weeks later, we're pretty much geared. Everyone's leveled. There's not really any contest anymore. Now, the big, I, I don't know. I, I think the rotation, the rules were always kind of like being worked and reworked. I think we had a free-for-all period. So it went like Faceless would get Nagafin, Ascended Darkness would get Nagafin. Mim would get Nagafin, and then there would be a free-for-all period. Or, in the beginning, it actually might have been Faceless, free-for-all. AD, free-for-all. Mim, free-for-all. So after every one, there was a free-for-all. Which seems equitable on the surface, uh, but the reality was that every free-for-all target was a Faceless target. We, we won, like, 99% of them. So, that slowly began to be a source of enmity with people. And then the other thing was that when servers went down, you know, sometimes raid mobs, specifically, I think like Inarook and Lady Vox would just be up when servers went down and they came back up, no matter what they were previously done in Windows. Um, and we decided unilaterally that those would be free for all. And that created created some drama. And that was, you know, it was uh, stupid of us to do that. But you got a lot of people who are very aggressive back in those eras and hungry for loot so they were eager so uh eventually at some point modest man gets in the rotation and we're pretty much happy to have them in there at that time our our situation with them was pretty positive we liked them dima gave me a lot of advice early on especially with like setting up the rotation and stuff he was in many ways like part of the architecture of of building that and over time um the relations with with Faceless and Modest Man just got worse and worse and worse. And it's hard for me to put my finger on any one thing that that did it all these years later. But I do just remember that it was like every time we had to deal with, with them, it, it felt like very underhanded. Like we came to you and we were very open about like what our intent was and what we were going to do very upfront. And it always felt like there was like ulterior motives there. Like there was like a little gamesmanship being played. So it was, it was kind of annoying and like everything you did would be screenshotted or logged and brought up later. Um, and then it would be like a game of influence of trying to like influence the other guilds to agree to less favorable rotation things, all, all that kind of stuff happened. And, and like a lot of inter guild poaching, it just all worked together to create bad blood between the guilds. So that basically happened. Now, for all of this early time up through Aya Vishan, I was still the guild leader. And then Darth eventually hits me up and he's like, hey man, what's up with this? Because I was supposed to be the, the guild leader. And I was like, you know what? You're right. So I make him the guild leader, but I keep playing as an officer. And uh, I mean, this was a six month unlock server and I was there for pretty much all of Classic. Uh, but you could see early on that Darth wasn't going to be what the guild needed when we had a threat. And I, I thought that even though I always felt like even though we had gotten the server first and we were in the dominant position, you could tell that Dima was really smart and his people were fanatically loyal to him. So the idea that like you win the mobs and then the people join you because they want to get more mobs just didn't work there. No matter how much he lost, people were just confident in him. You know what I mean? Because he had, he had carried the Fippy Guild all the way to the end. So that gives your your people a strong resolve to be like, yeah, these, these fly by night guilds that are top right now, it doesn't really matter. We'll stick with our guy, especially if you're in his guild on Fippy, um, which was doing quite well. I think you're obviously not going to side with this competition on another server. So he was just tough to deal with, tough to compete against, even though like you would beat him and you would log out that day feeling like you lost somehow. Still, it was actually pretty incredible uh, as a competitor. It was very uh, exhausting to deal with him. So I knew that Darth really wasn't up to the task of dealing with him because Darth had a problem and his problem was he could not shut the fuck up ever. He could never, 
he couldn't be humble. He couldn't even fake humility. You know what I mean? He couldn't go up there and, and be like, just put on the face. He, he had no customer service face. And we had a leadership chat channel in game that everyone would talk in. And he would say outrageous shit that would always be used against us for propaganda. And then people would, would re- repeat what he said. And then he would flip out about it. You know what I mean? It was just, it was a huge pain. So I was like, okay, we need to construct like th- the best officer team possible around this guy to protect the guild from what he will do. You know what I mean? And so there was a point where we had a really, really talented pool of officers. We had like a guy named Frozen who basically played 24-7, and I mean 24-7, like still slept at his computer kind of guy. We had Yogmoth, who was a talented raid leader and had uh he's like a very type A personality. So when Darth would do something stupid, he wouldn't be afraid to call him on it. It was very useful. We had a lot of good ad- admin types and good recruitment types. And then we had a guy named Selenius who was a calm head in a in the midst of a bunch of fiery personalities and that would be important later but uh so we kept raiding and we kept winning but it was just very exhausting that whole time now as for darth and his leadership abilities i think there's kind of three types of people when it comes to leadership there are people who are not leaders there are people who are good leaders and there are people who are bad leaders darth was a bad leader um And I say this, you know, I don't think, I'm not here saying that I'm a good leader or anything, right? No comment on myself, but Darth was a bad leader. But being a bad leader is better than having someone in charge who's not a leader, right? Because Darth, at the end of the day, he would be decisive. He would take initiative. And that's, those are the two bare minimum things you need a leader to do. So running his mouth and the other things that he would do were bad for PR, hurt our recruitment, hurt our image to this day, I would say, like almost 10 years later, still deal with the shocks from that. But it was better than someone who was afraid to make a decision, which a lot of guilds have those kind of guild leaders. So there was that. Anyway, while we're doing this, TL is on rage fire and they're doing their normal thing, right? They're fighting a bunch of guilds and they give them nothing. There's not an ounce, not a single shred of rotation. And that server is packed to the guilds with people. So we're over here bragging about our rotation. People are getting mobs. People are generally friendly, even the people who don't like each other. And Ragefire guilds are just suffering over the, you know, under the under the boot heel of Twisted Legacy. And eventually this guy named Doji from APOC convinces the the devs that there needs to be a mandatory rotation. There needs to be a mandatory rotation because they're not sharing on Ragefire. And devs are like, you know what? Fine, look, let's do it. So they they say that there's got to be a mandatory rotation. I think it was actually like Holly, Holly Longdale, who got super involved in the guild politics, more so than any other dev I've seen. Um, she was the person who was like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna mandate a rotation. And we're like, oh God. Like it wasn't just mandated on Rage Fire, it was mandated on Lockjaw. We're like, hey, we already got something here and it's working out just fine. But they just wanted a blanket thing. Now they weren't gonna build the rotation. They were like, you guys need to get 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 together, make a rotation rule and ratify it and give it to us and we'll stamp it and we will enforce it. And we're like, what do you mean you'll enforce it? And they're like, well, if you break the rotation, you'll get suspended. And we're like the whole guild. And they're like, yeah, the whole, the whole guilds will get suspended. And that's just crazy. Now, I think uh, Twisted, Twisted Legacy tried to fight it. They were trying to try. They tried tooth and nail to do every kind of crazy thing to get out of it. And we got together and I was like, hey, you know what I mean? Like we were already so far ahead on gear and everything than everyone else that my strategy that I offered up to the guild, right? Because I couldn't just make the decision. But the strategy I offered up to the officers was like, hey, what we need to do is make the the biggest, dumbest rotation possible. We knew that Dima was going to get with all the casual guild leaders, which when I say casual, I mean everyone but us. He was going to get with all of them. And try to get them to side against us to make a rotation that was really unfavorable to us, but would still allow him and his guild, which had now become a force on the server, to uh, to catch up to us. This is the last thing we wanted. So instead, I was like, let's let's shock everybody. We'll make the dumbest rotation possible. Whatever the casual guilds want, we will say that we're open to it. Like, don't just give a rotation where you have like 10 minutes to kill a mob where there's free-for-alls and blah, blah, blah. Like, say that 
when it's your turn to kill Nagafin, you have 24 hours from his spawn time to kill him, so any guild can do it. And uh, we wanted to make the rule set one super casual, and in exchange, the casuals would throw us a bone of free for alls every cycle. And we wanted to make it so that every mob in Plane of Hate, Plane of Sky, and Plane of Fear, like was part of the was part of the rotation agreement. We wanted a bunch of dumb rules so that it would be easy for people to accidentally break the rules. Now, when we went into these meetings, the meetings with the other guild leaders would last like six to eight hours. And the, the people on it, let's see who, who all was on the, this rotation. So it was Dead Halfling Society, Pisa Formosa X, which was like a, an Eastern time, in a Far East guild, like a lot of the Japanese players and stuff. And it was led, I, I, I was led by a guy from Japan, but the representative for the guild was actually this old lady who worked nights at like a, at like a grocery store. So she was like the, the English speaking person who would come to our meetings. Um, Legacy of Zek, which was a guild that formed out of Ascended Darkness for people who wanted to be more hardcore and contest Faceless more. The Forsaken Order. I, I really don't even remember who they are. Midnight Fire, which was an ultra, ultra casual guild. For, and uh, the Collector of Souls. Collector of Souls was a guild led by Drathus and King, aka Tadadar, and a few, like, it was like three or four people, basically, who just boxed a ton. And we were like, hey, you know, we'll add everyone. We, we wanted to add Collector of Souls because we're like, hey, we'll add you to the rotation if you vote with us in rotation agreements. And they were pretty much on board with it as long as they got some loot, right? So um, we, we set this all up and I remember, I think, I think Modest Man was pretty upset about the way the rotation talks went because it was just not what they were expecting at all. And the guilds did agree. They, they were like, hey, you guys can have your free-for-all. We will take our 24 hours. Now, Modest Man, I think, was super upset because if a mob is up for 24 hours, it means the next mob is delayed, right? It reduces the total number of raid mob spawns that happen on a server significantly which means less loot overall. But for us, we were already pretty much all best in slot, which meant it just meant that the people who wanted to catch up with us had a harder time doing so. And uh, I mean, that's pretty much how it went. Now for the free-for-alls, there was a lot of drama over those, like Modest Man would compete with us, Legacy of Zek would compete with us. I think Legacy of Zek had a really, really memorable one. It, this always came down to poop socking. There's a lot of good poop socking videos on YouTube. If, if you look up like EverQuest DPS Race, or you look at my YouTube channel. Um, there was this one really famous one where Legacy of Zek showed up and started socking, Zoc, uh, socking Lady Vox before the window opened. And we we're like, not this shit again. You know what I mean? And they had already changed. No, not yet. But soon they would change the mobs. Actually, yeah. So at this same time here, the devs had now changed the mobs and added mitigation of the mighty to them, which made them turn into these mobs that you could blitz down in 30 seconds to now they were kind of a beast. Um, if you do TLP rating those first few times that you clear those dragons when you don't have a lot of gear, it's pretty challenging, especially back then when people were not using exploits, like people weren't using, um, they weren't using like Shield of the Immaculate or J-Boot exploits where you stand behind a pillar or a wall and Lady Vox and Nord Nagafen can only just do their melee attacks, you know what I mean? And you just hold rotation with clicky buff spam. Um, so that, that wasn't a thing. So these guilds were getting beat up by these mobs. And I remember shortly after that happened, Legacy of Zek, which was led by a guy named Memory, M-E-M-R-Y, they started socking it and they socked it before the window went on and we were like, God, this sucks. And we were there at first and it was getting late and, you know, we were like, okay, everybody camp out and just sit at character select. And then Vox, now at, when, when you have a sock like this, by the way, every guild, there's, there's brinksmanship that happens. Every guild starts moving up a little bit closer. Like you start in a safe space where you would normally prep for these dragons. Like we started in King Room and then they move up to Diplomat. So then we have to move up to Diplomat. Then they move up to the Wooly Spider. Then we got to move there. You know what I mean? And before you know it, within an hour, you're both sitting at Lady Vox's spawn point. So we all camp out eventually. Now it's just them sitting at Lady Vox's spawn point. But it's in the middle of the night. They're, and they don't make the call to move to anywhere safe because if we log in at the last second, boom, you know, we're right there. 
Finally, Vox spawns. I think a lot of them were AFK. She spawns. She's got mitigation of the mighty. She just shreds their guild, goes through them. They get her down to like 20% or something, but they're totally wiped. We log in, just get the kill. Easy peasy, right on their corpses. And uh, there was a lot of drama over that. There was like a lot of memes, like Wrecking Ball was a big song back then. So they drew like Lady Vox on a wrecking ball, like crashing through their guild and, and all this other drama. And it was really good. And I think, well, not really good, but it was really funny. And I think that pretty much like that particular fight put the nail in the coffin of the competition with Legacy of Zek. I don't know that they ever actually won any big free for all mobs, but they, you know, they would show up and they would sock a lot. Ascended Darkness also would show up and sock a lot. Um, and like they socked Nagafin against us and Vox against us a few times. We had a lot of races. Every free for all, I would say, was was pretty much contested. And I think we we pretty much won almost all of them, though. Peace of Formosa X, the Japanese guild, was surprisingly, I think, the best competition we had from a pure like speed and, and performance standpoint. They would uh, regularly like have people bound or camped near the near the dragon, so they would never sock. But we would see a dragon spawn and be like, "Man, it's like four a.m. What if we wait an hour?" And then, boom! Peace of Formosa X is there engaging, and we'd have to log in and jump in and form the raid and DPS race them while they were already engaged. Like they were very fast when they decided to go for stuff. So we always had a lot of respect for them. And there were never any drama; just just a delight to work with. And you know, it was kind of Gilbert. You would race them. And after after it's over, you'd be like, hey, good game. That was awesome. And if you had rot loot, you'd be like, hey, do you guys want this? So really positive uh, relationship we had with them. Now, while we were doing this, something something kind of nefarious was building and faceless this whole time. Boxing on Lockjaw and Ragefire started to get out of control. We had a guy in, in Faceless who was a, a developer. He was actually an EverQuest 2 developer. And he used this custom macro quest compile that he was making himself like very tailored, not anything like what people usually use. And the guy, before he quit, he was boxing over 100 characters. But at this time in Classic, he was boxing like 30 characters, along with another guy in our guild named Lil Mez. They would both box like 30. They combined to have like a huge raid. Because he was a dev, I don't know if he did it for all his accounts, but he certainly did it for our leadership's accounts. Like my account had a flag that I didn't have to pay for EverQuest anymore. So the whole time that he worked for Daybreak Games, or I think maybe it was SOE still at that time, my shit was free. Like I, my thing always said I had zero days on my account. Remember, you used to have like an account timer on when you had to renew, and it never, it never went out. One day, like years later, I logged in and, and it didn't work anymore, and I was like, oh man, that's what's up? And uh, I hit him up, and I was like, hey, I noticed this happened. Was there something going on? He's like, oh yeah, I got a job somewhere else. So like when he left the company, that went away. But up until that point, yeah, all the faceless leadership had like free paid for accounts. Um, so anyway, they started boxing like crazy. And he's actually the guy who got the code put in to make it so that you can slash follow outside of your group. Remember back in the day, you could only follow people who were in your group. And he got it changed because he got tired of being accused of macro questing, even though he was, he just didn't want people to be able to say, you know, unequivocally that, that he was. So he got that put in. The problem with having people like this in your guild is they start to look at each other and say, you know what? We could probably just kill this by ourselves. Anytime that happens in a guild, it's bad news. It's bad news because you if you don't have any competition you don't have an incentive to wake up and kill these mobs at 4 a.m but those guys typically are willing to do it and it creates a problem you know what i mean and that'll come up come up to haunt us a little bit later but in the meantime we're kind of at this standstill with the mandatory rotation um eventually there's a problem where um modest man has a I think it was like an applicant named Sniffs, maybe. I don't even know if anyone knew who this guy was, but he went up to Plain of Sky by himself with like a three box of mages and started killing the fairies on Island One to farm spells. And naturally, we caught wind of it. We went up there, we took a video, and we're like, look, they broke the rotation. We submitted it. And uh, the entire guild, Modest Man, got suspended. Like every single character 
if you were an account that was tagged modest man, your account was suspended for seven days. This included like just tons of people who didn't even play on the server anymore, but a lot of people who played on Fippy still. So it was incredible in that it it created a big problem for them because it stopped their Fippy rating and, and really hurt it for a week. And the drama bomb that came from that was just incredible. And I remember there was a point where I was talking, it was like Friday night at like 1 a.m. my time Eastern. And a bunch of like, it was like faceless and modest man officers talking to like Prathen or some some other, I don't even remember, Paestro? It was maybe it was Paestro um, on the forums. And he was responding to us. And I was like, dude, it's like pretty dang late on a Friday evening, even in California where he's probably at for him to be dealing with this drama. And I, I hit up the other officers and I was like, I don't think this shit is going to last much longer because like we're driving them crazy. And you could just see it. They were always in discussions with us, the, the staff, the devs, and you could see that they hated it. It was taking up too much of their time. They were all angry about it. The players were angry about it. Everyone was just being a whiny baby. Like guilds thought that they weren't getting enough. They thought rotations weren't fair. Big guilds thought that they were giving too much away People were putting petitions in all the time. And then suddenly they come out and they say, hey, we're no longer enforcing mandatory rotations. And overnight, it's just over, right? On, uh, on Ragefire, TL takes back over. Boom, no more, no more targets for anybody. On, on Lockjaw, Faceless, same, not, not the same thing. Faceless goes back to the, the other guilds. And I think we agree to have a rotation with guilds that we were on good terms with or that were willing to to hit mobs like you know we kept a rotation but it was more competitive we we're like hey you have like you have to kill mobs when they spawn right but it's yours we won't contest it but if you leave it up for like an hour we're gonna come kill it so that was kind of the thing and that went back to like the original rotation people mim ascended darkness um maybe legacy of zek maybe dead halfling society i can't remember if they were included piece of formosa x was definitely still included I don't know that Midnight Fire was still included. I think they were. Midnight Fire was still included, and they were the, the first group to like lose a mob for like not showing up for their mob. But the one group that wasn't included was Modest Man. Now, Modest Man refused to agree to the rotation because we went back to only rotating the big four targets, the two gods, the two dragons. We specifically refused to rotate the Afridi cycle in Plain of Sky, and they refused to join any rotation that did not have an Afridi cycle. For us, this is exactly what we wanted. We knew that we could push the issue and it would create this standstill. So at that point, Modest Man like voluntarily pulled themselves out of the rotation because they didn't agree to the rules. They tried a lot of propaganda, but at the end of the day, they pulled themselves out of the rotation. A little bit before this or around the same time, Rage Fire and Lockjaw had an open period where you could move between the servers. I think it allowed some kind of item dupe for a while, which hurt the economies. Um, but the big thing was that Realm of Insanity from um, from Ragefire, Reign of Insanity, it was led by Q Loss, who was like the the live guild leader for ROI too, but it was their their TLP guild. They were they decided they were going to come over to Lockjaw, but they didn't just decide they were going to come over. They were talking to Dima to join Modest Man. They were gonna they were gonna merge and become a super guild. And I was like, oh man, we we like we cannot let that happen, right? That would be disastrous for us. So I start talking to them. And uh, I get in, I get in their ears, and we're meeting like all the time, every day in voice. And I, you know, Kulas and I really, I think, hit it off. I really like the guy, even to this day, even though we haven't talked in a while. Hey, Kulas, if you're out there, love you, dude. Hope, hope you're doing well. I heard uh, things in your real life are looking good. Last time, last time, someone was talking about you, so that's great. Um, but yeah, we really hit it off, and they decide to come over and merge with us. But I, I think we kept it a secret, so. Basically, the server merge option opens, their whole guild comes over, and Deem is there like waiting, you know, for his influx of 50 top tier talented players, and they all join faceless. And he sent me, it was like maybe the only time I ever saw him mad. He sent me a tell. He's like, You're a fucking trash can, Zade. And I was just like, it was so good because he was so unflappable. You know what I mean? He never seems to lose his cool. So to see him get mad at that uh, felt like a big win for us. But yeah, then that's when the, the name Faceless Insanity came. Because before that, we were actually just called Faceless Guild, which was a stupid guild name 
then uh, one of the devs, Flood Wolf, H L U D Wolf, came over and just changed our guild name. Boom, Faceless Insanity when we asked. So that was awesome. Just remember that if you ever ask the GMs to change your name and they say they can't do it, they can. They, if, they, if they say no, it's just because they don't think your guild's important enough. So that happened. And then um, the whole time when we were in that rotation, even, it was, it was kind of, there, there were things that, that really sucked. Like we would go watch the other, tar- the other guilds kill their targets and stuff. Whenever we watched Modest Man kill their targets, even though we were like now months into the server, they were still mage walling. Like they would kill CT, even though Mitigation of the Mighty was on them. And that was specifically done, one, because, because Faceless killed the dragons too fast on launch. And it kind of exposed the weakness of them. And because of the continued uh, mage walling, they made made mitigation of the mighty, right? That's why that was done. Now, initially devs thought that that would stop mage walling. But then Modest Man kept mage walling everything. They, They still did it. They just had like 40 mages now instead of three or five. And it was just crazy to watch. Like you have a rotation target, you can do whatever you want with it, but you still just use this cheese method to do it rather than have like a real guild thing. And, and people thought it was really distasteful. I think most guilds can understand doing like doing it in the, the cheesy way for the fastest thing that you can do, like to do it that first time or second time um, early on when, when the, just the server maturity isn't there yet. But when you're months and months in, it just seems a little tacky to keep doing it. I'm sure to some people that sounds hypocritical. Um, and I guess it, it, it probably is. But there's just some kind of difference there, an intangible difference that I can't really explain well between using a mage wall on the first Nagafin and using it four months later on the 50th Nagafin. It's just not quite the same for some reason. So anyway, they kept doing that. And then the devs added Mark of the Old Ways. Now that's the buff that mobs got that made it so that if there were more than 10... First, the, the biggest thing was like pets would no longer be tanking raid mobs. Mobs just ignored pets. The the aggro a pet would generate would go to the player instead. So right there, you could no longer tank anything with a pet if it was a raid mob. Second, if you had more than 10 pets on a target, they would get incrementally weaker. Early on, it was even crazier. I think it was more than three, and they they dialed it back a little bit. So early on, pets were super bad on raid mobs when they did that. Now, at the time, Plain of Sky got the same treatment that everything else did, which was a percentage-based increase. And Mitigation of the Mighty turned Plain of Sky into like a hellish end zone that I think only three guilds, maybe only two guilds, ever cleared in, in this current form. Twisted Legacy and Faceless definitely killed bees and killed the Afridi cycle in the most busted form when, when Big B and Hand of Visham were hitting the, for like the same DPS output as Ralph Zek in Planes of Power. We, we did that during Classic. Um... Modest Man might have also done it. I just, I legit don't remember. So if you're a viewer or you're a listener, I suppose, feel free to hit me up in Discord and, and let me know. And when I do the addendum for this in Rage Fire, I will confirm whether or not Modest Man got, got the B and got hand during that period. Um, and, and honestly, that was like a really big accomplishment. I think a lot of people from all those guilds who did it were proud because like the mobs were just so hard. So you really had to, to go crazy to get, to kill them. It was only that way for like, a month, maybe less, before it got fixed. And and the Plain of Sky mobs still have Mark of the Old Ways and Mitigation of the Mighty, but it's kind of like a customized version that dialed them all back a little bit. So we're back to that broken rotation. We have the, the de facto rotation that we agree to sort of out of generosity, out of a desire to keep the server um, a, a fair place to play. And Modest Man drops out. The whole time we're doing this, both the early rotation and the later rotation and the mandatory rotation, all this shit. People in our guild were very upset about it. The whole time people are always like, why don't we just stomp all these guilds? We don't need them. Blah, blah, blah. Like people really back then did not care about the other guilds. They didn't care about longevity. They thought that if people wanted loot, they should join faceless or whatever random top guild was. You know what I mean? They were not happy about the the kind of rotating we were doing, but there was no, there was no one else on the server who was doing what we were doing. Right. So you just didn't have a lot of choice. Your choice was to transfer over and join Twisted Legacy or to stay with Faceless and deal with the fact that we were going to be rotating. But the Modest Man drama really did erode a lot of our appetite, even in the leadership team for rotating, because 
there was constant propaganda, which wasn't helped by the crazy dumb shit Darth would say about how we were like bad guys ruining the server, even though we were constantly working with the leadership of other guilds to ensure that no one was completely blocked out of content. And it just really sucked to, to be like, you're holding back so much, you know what I mean? And you're giving other guilds so much that you don't have to give them so much more than what we were given when we were younger guilds on other servers and to still be painted as the bad guy, despite all that. Right. And we're like, you could just look at rage fire. Like how many Nagafins did APOC get? Outside of the mandatory rotation, zero. And guilds are guilds were mad at us, and they had gotten like tons of charity kills. Um, so it really took a lot of the appetite to to work with people out of that guild. I think we still did it, but when Modest Man left the rotation, they started bat phoning every target. To them, every target was free for all, which makes sense, right? Um, this was good and bad. First, it made the guilds the other guilds not like Modest Man because Modest Man was coming to steal their mobs. For us, we were like, hey, we're going to come and make sure that Modest Man doesn't get the mobs. So we would come and like if it was your Kazakh Thul and you weren't able to get the, the force there before Modest Man, we would come and kill it right in front of you and then give you the loot. Now, it's great that you got the loot, but people generally feel pretty bad about that because they didn't get to kill their mob. Of course, they weren't going to kill it anyway because the other guild was going to steal it from them and steal the loot. But overall, the whole situation was just pretty toxic for everybody. Um, so they were mad at Modest Man, but they were also mad at Faceless because to them, it seemed like a pretty small point, right? They're like, hey, if you guys just rotate a Freedy, um, this can all go away and we can all get together and there won't be drama. But for us, it wasn't even about a Freedy, right? Obviously, we didn't care about a Freedy. It was about having an excuse to have the situation. Like we didn't want it to be that way, but we wanted Modest Man to be out of the rotation. We wanted them, what they were doing to themselves, we thought was good. And it was kind of like the calculus is, hey, if we have to take a little bit of reputation hit so that they can take a huge reputation hit, we'll, we'll do that. The trade was considered fair. So that goes on and on. And we actually lost, um, we lost a few Efridi Cycle poop socks to, to Modest Man in this era because we were really, really heavy on wizards in classic. And they just didn't do anything there. And Modest Man was heavy on monks. But I think that was the only big stuff that they ever really beat us on. They beat us on like one Yale and like two or three Efridi Cycles. Of course, I'm biased, but that's my memory. Anyway, Kunark launch comes around and. It's like pretty much a blowout. We we crushed track. I think we had like an embarrassing thing where where we pulled track down. And remember, this is mitigation of the mighty track, so no one knows what it's going to be like. Okay, no one no one knows how hard it's going to be. We pull him down. We're fighting him in, and he's down by the bridge, and then he gets low health and he starts to run or something. No, I think he he just like chased someone who was low health. He ended up being in the tunnels when we're fighting him. And we get him down to like 20%. He's going down. We're going to win. And this motherfucker gates. And we're like, holy shit. We didn't even know tracking on gate. I mean, it's only like 100 meters away. But he gates. And then when a mob gates, it instantly pops him up to 30%, which on a mitigation of the mighty track on is actually a big deal. You got to figure your whole raid is hit with a dot right now, getting ticked on. And then he summons the tank immediately, kills the tank. Everyone has to rush up there. It, it just became a wipe right we we just lost victory immediately just because of that um so i think we i forget if we killed him a second attempt right there or if we went and just got some levels and came back but you know in the end we we crushed kunark launch and we had you know it was known amongst the guilds that the the kunark rotation would be agreed upon after like the first week or two of kunark once everything in kunark was cleared because we still had to clear the whole expansion to start the timer to start the six month timer for the next expansion. So um, priority number one was killing Faradar, getting that done. And we weren't going to talk about any kind of rotation stuff until that was done. So we do that and it comes time to talk about rotations and uh, the guild just didn't want to do it. I wanted to do it, but the guild didn't want to do it. There's a lot of back and forth trying to figure it out. It wasn't like a hard no, but it, it just wasn't, it wasn't looking good for rotating tracking on. We had a ton of pressure internally from the big boxers that I talked about earlier to not rotate anything. And they, we, we got to where like, we couldn't, we could not be bothered to kill like Talandor or Gornair. You know what I mean? Cause it's the same loot that we already had a million of. So why would we wake up 
But these guys were like, well, if you guys don't wake up, we're going to kill it. And we're like, well, what, what can we do to stop them? Right? Like if we kick these two guys who are boxing 30 plus characters out of our guild, it doesn't change what they do. It's just like now we're losing to a competition, a competitive force, or, or we just let them be here as members and do it. But the bottom line is like, if we don't want to wake up and kill it, someone's going to kill it. I guess it should be them. So it put us in a real weird position. And then you got people who do want to kill it. There's like, you know, imagine there's like 15 people in the guild who are like, yeah, I'll wake up and kill 4am Talenter for the rest of my life. And you're like, well, we're not going to do that. And they're like, oh, but you're going to let these two boxers kill it. Well, then I'm going to quit the guild. It was a real, real bad position to be in. And once these people realize the kind of power they have, it's bad too, because now they know they have you by the nuts internally. And you end up getting more people who box and banding together and making little crews. And the guild becomes like a, a series of clicks that you've got to kind of play politics to manage constantly. And uh, around this time, they announced the Finney server, which is going to have instancing. And overnight the server was just like gone. Like everything was being sold. People just wanted to get, uh, get their shit liquidated and plan for, for uh, Finney. And some of the guilds were like, hey, like, what's going to go on with that track rotation? And um, Faces Leadership, we just were not able to get a, a clear answer internally. People really didn't want to do it. So we, we couldn't give them a hard answer. We couldn't say, yes, track on rotation now. You know what I mean? Um, and smartly, all those guilds decided to go to Finney pretty much. like, Or Ragefire. I think one went to Ragefire. But basically, no one was going to stay on a server where they had to basically kowtow to some arrogant guild to get mobs when there was a server that was only one expansion behind and would progress faster three months instead of six months and they would have all the instance rating they could ever want. So um, our inability to agree to any of those rotations later basically was the, the absolute death knell. I mean, even if we agreed to it, it would be stupid to stay on lockjaw if you're not the top guild because like, who wants to have to deal with relying on the mercy of, of another guild, every expansion, right? No one wants to deal with that. So they all made the smart choice and people left. Um, when, when Modest Man broke up and decided they were going to Finney, I remember it was like right after a, a bat phone for Veneral Sathir when I got the news. And I was like so relieved because I knew at that point the competition was over. I only ever wanted to stay on Lockjaw long enough to cement Faceless as the top guild to make sure that there was no risk they would lose and then to try to establish a good server that people could play on. And I stayed so, so much longer than I wanted to because there was always a good chance that Faceless, I, I always felt like there was a good chance Faceless could lose to Modest Man because I was confident that Dima could outplay Darth in the political arena and ally the guilds against him and just use his own tendencies to, to beat him. So when, when they logged off and they said like, Hey, we're going to, to Finnegal, I logged off for the last time there. I just camped and I was like, done peace. I wasn't the guild leader. So I didn't have to worry about any of that. And that felt really, really good to have that off my shoulders. Now faceless insanity went on to be like a, just a killer guild for a long time. They, they wanted to catch rage fire as all second servers do. And I think they had a multi-month gap because Ragefire had a rotation. They, the, Ragefire had a vote to shorten their classic timer, just their classic timer, and they voted yes. So they unlocked Kunark before us. And uh, Lockjaw almost, almost bridged the gap by finishing every expansion so much faster. Uh, and Ragefire had a tumultuous time with top guilds because like, I don't want to ruin the Ragefire episode, but spoiler alert, Twisted Legacy had like a whole coup that happened. They formed a new guild and went to Finney and then Darkwind took over Ragefire for a while. Darkwind fell apart. And then I think some other guild became the top guild eventually all the way to present day where like now the top guild I think is called Tempest. Um, but basically these servers became servers that you played on only because you wanted to macro quest and you wanted to box because remember Finney had true box. So if you wanted to be a big boxer and all the, the people, the most, I would say like 90% of the types of people who are boxing big on Lockjaw and Ragefire are using macro quest to assist with their boxing. So it became one of those servers. Faceless had a serious talk about going to Finnegal or not going to Finnegal. Well, Finnegal was, was going to hit and start classic like 
two or three weeks or maybe a month after we had just finished six grueling months of classic. And we were like, cannot do this again. No, absolutely no way. Could we do another six months? Like you can't just do 12 straight months of classic content. At least Rage Fire had like a little bit of a break. So we passed on that. Of course, we were already on top. So who cared? And, uh, you know, Faceless was largely uncontested for the remainder of the server. There were a few other guilds that stayed on. I don't think that they ever found um, it to be a good a good deal for them as compared to having instance rating options on Finny. And I think a, a lot of the trouble trouble that Faceless and Sanity went on to have was, you know, small groups of people who just really didn't want to share. Some of the people I know are just like dudes who live in abject poverty and they literally depended on being able to block other guilds out of content with their box crews so they could kill mobs, get the loot and sell the loot back to the smaller guilds, like to, to fund their groceries every week. Um, I'm sure people are going to be real mad that I said that, but I mean, that's the reality of it. You had guys who were legit living in, in extreme poverty and, killing trash tier pop mobs during pop and blocking smaller guilds from progressing was how they fed their family. And uh, it was just, it, it sounded like a terrible place. Again, I'm speaking from the outside after that because like it was all kind of like grapevine stuff from, from that faceless. Uh, as for Darth, he went crazy over some item in Valius. He, he would frequently have huge drama sessions over not getting loot first. This was not a DKP guild at first. It was a Marriott loot guild. And he always wanted every item first, including like two handed items that were stupid for warriors to use. And, you know, he just kind of had like a little tyranny about it and uh, people let it go. But eventually he, he created some big problem over like a Vulak ax. I think it was Palladius ax of slaughter with a member who was like pretty popular. It went over quite poorly. He met with one of the other, officers in real life Selenius he met with him in real life and uh Selenius was such a good dude he was always a fantastic member of Faceless when he was there he was super calm voice of reason kind of person there so he was really well loved by membership and I like him even to this day Darth went on on a, a trip and met Selenius in real life and I mean he he came back and then he would he started these little whispers and rumors that that he you know had had done some inappropriate things with Selenius's spouse like at a restaurant in a in a in a restroom um and of course i say this no one literally no one believes it everyone knew he was lying about this and he would frequently kind of try to like chat up you know female members of the guild in kind of a gross way. So um, no one believed this for even a second, but he made the claim and it got to a point where there was like, okay, we're having a coup. Selenius became the guild leader. Darth was on the outs. Darth would go on to try to make a guild on like Agnar and some other server that was going to beat faceless. And like, I mean, insert fart noise here, right? Like literally never amounted to anything. Um, so but basically, unless he was handed a, a fully formed functioning guild, he wasn't going to do anything with it. Selenius, on the other hand, super successful for years and years and years with Faceless. Um, led that led that guild extremely well. Top top notch guy. Eventually, they merged into Ragefire, not the server, but the guild did because there was just nothing left there. So all, all remaining guilds went over to Ragefire that were on Lockjaw, and. I think they did that during DODH or something. So I, I want to say that for like the first uh, first expansion, he was over there. He was the top guild. Not positive if that was if that was true. If Faceless was the top guild for there for even one one expansion. Um, but I do know that Prophecy of Rogue came out around the same time Cello came out, and this will come up in other episodes. But there there was a point in time where Faceless was the top guild on Lockjaw, the top guild on Agnar, and they were about to launch on Cello at the same time. And uh, we we called basically all hands on deck for Cello. A lot of people came over and the Agnar Guild basically died immediately. It was already done, right? Agnar was finished, so it didn't matter. But anything that was left on Agnar came to Cello. A lot of the guys from Lockjaw assisted in the Cello launch. 
And then POR launch happened on uh, Rage Fire after they moved over there, which was around the same time. And I think the top guild over there was led by Yukan, who had led Ascended Darkness during the classic and Kunark times on, on Lockjaw. So he had a bone to pick with Faceless. And there was some kind of alliance with big boxers, and basically it became like everybody left on Rage Fire versus the, the Faceless guys who came over. And Faceless just lost. They lost Prophecy of Roe. Uh, launch because they they were getting beat on the poop sock dps races in theater of blood so they they couldn't win enough in time to get the server first they merged with another guild to create something that's not called faceless and after that happens i'd like just immediately don't care um so any any part of that will have to be during the rage fire episode but that was kind of the end but uh i've played with selenius now on multiple servers gosh and multiple games and he's just a rock star so i can't say enough positive about him Honestly, Lockjaw was a ton of fun. It was incredibly competitive, like racing every single free-for-all mob. Uh, and, and the mobs were spawning every 24 hours. So it was fast. You know what I mean? It was a lot. It, it was incredibly fun. And I think that we really, if there just wasn't that animosity between Modest Man and Faceless back then, I think we really had the, the perfect server because you had the competitive aspect for people who wanted to do it. You had content available for everybody else. And because there weren't instances, everyone still had to interact. Everyone still knew each other. Um, I, I do look back on early Lockjaw as really kind of a small paradise. There was just, it was unfortunate that we had some toxic elements um, in leadership of various guilds. And by all means, I was part of that. I was part of that problem. But those toxic elements also, you know, brought their own good things and stuff. So you can't have one without the other. Um, I think it goes down as a successful server in those early eras in the sense that a ton of people had a ton of fun, a ton of people got to access content. And insofar as that was our goal, we did it. And then on the other hand, we reshaped a lot of TLP EQ rating, the guilds on that server. Like mitigation of the mighty wouldn't have existed without what Lockjaw did. Mark of the old ways would not exist without what Lockjaw did. Um, the mandatory rotation was not a result of us, but the the dissolution of it was probably largely caused by our our issue in Plane of Sky with Modest Man and maybe a little bit of some stuff Doji did on Rage Fire with APOC. Um, so it really it was it was uh, just an amazing server. After this, the next time Faceless would play Fresh would be Agnar because we skipped Finny, so it would be like two years. But um, that's a story for another day. So. Um, our next episode might be the Mischief TBS, or sorry, SOF launch. You know what? Maybe I should do a TBS launch, SOF launch combo episode where I talk about both of them because they're kind of, you know, it's kind of one story. Um, and then we have someone who's probably going to be on the show later this week who is a, a member of the staff, staff of a game we all love. Um, I won't name them. It'll be a surprise. But yeah, should that should happen. So look forward to that. Um, if you tuned in all the way to the end, thank you. I probably forgot some stuff. It's probably going to be pretty normal for me to do like the two server episodes and then an addendum episode where I go over anything that I missed. And I'll try to always throw in a little rant. It seemed like a lot of people enjoyed the, the discussion about the drama tax. So I'm sure I'll have something else to complain about. Um, by the way, disable levitate and plane of fire. And skip every door that you could possibly find in EverQuest because that's what you're supposed to do. And fuck anybody who says otherwise. Thanks.